without introducing the, the next speaker, um, is uh, Sven Steinmo. He's a professor of public policy and political economy at uh, the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Um, and he's going to uh, talk about evolutionary processes, but uh, in institutional change, so uh, in a quite different uh, environment. I feel a bit like a uh, fish that's been thrown up on, this, on the uh, shore uh, in this conference. Uh, there's a lot of real people who really understand the evolutionary theory from the biological point of view, and I'm a person that's really an interloper. I'm a social scientist, a political scientist. I'm an empiricist. I study things like tax systems. And, um, and I've been long interested in questions of variation and change. But political science has been pretty poor, uh, uh, is very poor at uh, explaining variation and explaining change. 20 years ago, I finished my first book. And uh, I was on tech, the history of taxation systems. And at the end of that book, it was uh, in the mid-1980s, and I was coming to the conclusion that everything was going to change. Lots of people were arguing the same thing, that globalization, though that word wasn't really coined at the time, was about to change everything. And I had studied uh, social democratic systems. I'd studied uh, liberal market systems and conservative systems. And so what uh, I, I wrote, and lots of people then wrote, uh, or would agree with was that political systems all have to converge to the bottom. In other words, we've all heard race to the bottom, globalization is going to create an end of the welfare state. I published an article called The End of Redistribution. Recently, I became interested in why I was so wrong. And I started thinking more broadly about this. And what I realized is that most political science predictions just like most economic predictions, are wrong. Uh, this is a, a cartoon from the New York Times recently. There's a big controversy about the National Science Foundation, whether it should fund political science. And um, one of the arguments against funding uh, political science is that it's not a real science. And, a and it's not a real science because their predictions are always so wrong. And I I'm actually fairly sympathetic to that argument. I, I'm just actually trying to look at the next slide myself so I can keep where I'm going. See, I don't know how to do that on this one. Um, I'm sympathetic to the argument if what we have to do, if what we mean by science is some version of physics. And I think what a lot of people mean by science is some version of physics. Now, at about that time, and I, just for personal interest, I started reading some evolutionary biology. I specifically read some Ernst Meyer's work and Robin Dunbar's work and so on. And I became really interested. I started thinking, you know, maybe political systems are more like evolutionary or complex adaptive systems than physical phenomenon like uh, we would expect to see in, um, from physics, or at least from Newtonian physics. And so that's what sort of made me, got me going in a different direction. Now, think about globalization. Globalization is not simply the, the change of uh, increase in capital flows and so on. There's economic competition, clearly, uh, aging populations around the Western world, increasing frustration, distrust of public authority, and fiscal crisis everywhere. And what I predicted, and what virtually everyone predicted, was this. A race to the bottom. Now, I've already said this a little bit, but this is actually what we find. Continued divergence. Now, why is that? Why is it not that we see divergence, but why did we predict something that's so completely wrong? And this is where Ernst Meyer and others uh, thinking in what I think of as evolutionary terms, and I suspect I have a rather naive notions. In fact, I know I have rather naive notions of evolution. But I came up with this analogy, and I, I, I will see if you um, think this might apply. It seems to me that if uh, I asked you all 
evolutionary biologists and geneticists and microbiologists. If I asked you, what would you expect, how would you expect two similar creatures, let's say a, a ground squirrel in America and a tree squirrel in, uh, in Africa, how would they adapt to global warming? My guess is your answer would be either, well, it depends, or probably in diverse ways. But a political scientist and economist would say, oh, no, they've got to do the same thing. They're going to adapt in the same way. Maybe they'll all, all lose their hair because the world is going to get warmer. But if you think about it a moment, even if the average temperature on the world gets, goes up by three degrees, it does not mean that every place on the planet the temperature goes up by three degrees. So in fact, some parts of the globe will get undoubtedly much colder if global warming continues. Moreover, those similar subspecies will have had previous evolutionary and, bio, uh, and behavioral adaptations that even if the temperatures grew in similar amounts in these two different parts of the planet, the ecology in which they live and the, the competition for resources they have may lead one to go extinct and another to prosper. In other words, I doubt that you would predict a race to the bottom, that all species, or all even similar species, would have to do the same thing. So it starts to make me think a little bit about the ontology of political science. And this is one uh, uh, from a, uh, it's a very, very cited and very, very respected uh, scholar who writes about political science, what we are, and many, many other people written similar. But social science is a vision world composed of linear relationships among variables, parity in cause and size and effect, recurrent patterns over time, and the fundamental insignificance of chance. This didn't seem like what I read from Meyer's work. It seemed to me that in evolution, I mean, again, I'm, this is your discipline, so I shouldn't want to try and tell you, but it seems to me that contingency matters, emergent effects, uh, emergent phenomena can occur, and those can have subsequent historical effects. In other words, it seems to me that we were using, we have been using in political science and economics just as much, a Newtonian vision of history when in fact a evolutionary version of human history should or more likely apply. We predict equilibrium when you almost never see equilibrium in the social world. If it is, it's very transitory. We can't explain variation across countries or populations. And, interestingly, we assume behavior at the micro level of individuals which is empirically wrong. That's sort of problematic, it seems to me. Now, okay, I would stop here for a moment and, and, and say quite honestly, I think that the attempt to, to apply or think about evolutionary processes for human agents is difficult and maybe wrong. Why? At least at some level one argues that evolution is a product, that variation is a product of random variation, at least some forms of evolution is. And that selection is, uh, uh, it's difficult for us to see what the selection mechanisms are. And then how, what would the retention mechanism be in social institutions? Now, that's what I've tried to spend my time thinking through. But before I can get to the, my short answers to those questions, I think we have to think, rethink what we think about human beings from both economists and uh, most political scientists tend to think of man as being irrational, self-interested, utility maximizers against all the evidence. Um, most cognitive scientists and evolutionary psychologists would say instead that humans are rational very often and often quite self-interested, but they are also social creatures. And what, in, from my point right now, what the most important feature of that is that human beings are rule followers. There's a big debate, Gintis and all of this uh, uh, have evoked about whether fair and these people, many of you know, about whether human beings are really 
in their hearts uh, part altruist or whether some part of the population are altruistic or not. I'm agnostic on that point. I think, I think it's, it sounds right to me, but okay, maybe it doesn't work out mathematically. But what it seems, from as far as I can tell, it's widely agreed that humans, like all social, social creatures, have a preference for following norms. They want to do what's expected of them, and they want others to do as expected of them. Now, there's a perfectly rational explanation for that, but it's deeply, in my view, it's deeply embedded in our, even perhaps, DNA. Finally, Kahneman and others, especially Tversky and Kahneman, have shown that humans are, decisions are deeply biased. In other words, we have, there are multiple biases that we engage in, but most importantly, we uh, have confirmation bias. We also confirm, once a pattern is developed, we put other new phenomena into that pattern. Okay, so humans are rule following, partly self-interested, and deeply biased. So let me try a shot at what I think are sources of variation, selection, and retention. I think instead of saying human cognition abrogates evolution of social institutions, that human cognition is the source of evolution of human social institutions. And variation happens through what I call creative ideas. Not, most of us are rule followers, but sometimes someone will have a new idea. What I mean by an idea is a very specific thing. It is a probabilistic solution to a collective action problem. And occasionally in history, most people simply follow the rules, do what's expected, and act according to a logic of appropriateness. But occasionally in history, there are unique individuals or unique ideas that come to the fore, and because I think history itself is dynamic, those ideas are, uh, can become what Dennett calls a good trick, can be a solution to a problem, and can be attractors. This is one of them. Obviously, the idea that women should have the right to vote was built on a previous set of ideas and institutions having to do with equality of individuals, having to do with the, uh, even further back into, uh, I think you can trace this idea all the way back to a, uh, to the idea that there is only one God and you are equal under God. But this policy idea has huge implications for the structure of, in this case, the modern democratic state. So ideas are the source, in my view, of, of variation. We invent things, so I, the variation doesn't have to be random, in my view. Selection. Cognition is, again, the core. Human beings learn. And I can be, I can be convinced, again, an idea is a probabilistic solution. Doesn't mean it's a good solution. Doesn't mean it's, I will uh, agree with it. And it doesn't mean it's even right but it can convince people to go along with it, like the idea for the right for women to vote. We, all, we are constantly building institutional rules in which we are fighting over what should we do. In fact, the biggest battles in politics are over institutional rules. Now here's the third and last. What are the mechanisms for retention? I think the institutions themselves, both most importantly formal, but even some informal institutions, are the mechanisms for retention. They are, in a funny way, I will, um, I'm nervous to say this, but they're the genes of politics. That's what, when we write them down, when the founding fathers of the United States wrote down this is the first page of the Constitution, they establish a set of rules which dictated or shaped or structured how individuals in that social community should act, establish a hierarchical structure of power, and introduced a mechanism or a, a formal document that then 
transfers this behavior, these structures of behavior from one generation to the next. I don't mean biological generation, I mean a social generation, which can be, and indeed in this, in democracies, is much, much faster. Tell me how much time I have left, because I know we got, okay. Now, what I, um, I've just finished a book, and I will not really tell you about this book, because in five minutes I can, I'll tell you very little bit about it. Um, it's called The Evolution of the Modern State. And what I did is I tried to think about the ways in which um, you might think and use evolutionary logic or evolution as a metaphor to explain why the United States, Japan, and Sweden diverged so amazingly in their response to globalization. If you look at the facts of the case that these countries did completely different things and completely different things from what, one, what people, including me, predicted. And why I ended up arguing uh, or uh, writing were our, what I call evolutionary narratives, which is a phrase I actually stole from Mayer. And what I try and do is understand the logic of in each country. And I'll do a very quick version. I think in five minutes I can do this for this American case. I do a version of this kind of analysis, what uh, uh, historical process tracing analysis in each of these countries. And I try and look at how are the, the origins of each of these modern states and what kinds of processes and institutions were built. Now, to start with the United States, I start, I'll use this one because I had the Constitution up. I'll just continue the logic of this. Think about, I think this is a case of what, uh, of allopatry. These liberal ideas come to this incredible rich continent. And that continent is depopulated, largely by smallpox and other diseases, and some by cavalry. But it is an incredibly rich continent. And these liberal ideas, which are brought from England, not invented here, these liberal ideas, ideas about all men being equal, everyone should have maximum freedom, etc., land in this very rich petri dish and grow like grows like a mushroom. But these ideas, these creative ideas of how do we solve problems, where keep government away from us, fear of democracy, fear, uh, and they specifically said what we should do, and if you read the Constitution itself, it was, we have a problem because we have lots of land and we have to stop each other from fighting over it. And interestingly, the Founding Fathers thought, understood that political power would be used to exer extract resources from the whole. So what they wanted to do was uh, fragment the political power. They called that the checks and balances system. It was a very, very creative and extremely interesting argument. And they ensconced it in the Constitution that so that the states couldn't fight for the new lands and no individuals could expropriate it. And then they invited the world. And what happens is, that, is uh, quite literally, is the wealth of America is, like I said, a petri dish. This is just a, 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 an interesting figure I put up. This is the percentage of world output of all of the major uh, uh, minerals used for industrialization in 1913. The United States had 95% of the world's gas production. 65% of petroleum, 56% of pop, copper. We were the number one producer of every single basic mineral at the beginning of the 20th century. That's just damn good luck. Actually, it's not quite true because we were the number two producer of gold. Transvaal produced more gold than the United States. But other than that, we were the number one producer. In other words, the Petri ditch was rich. The institutions, however, were framed in a, to be dysfunctional. That was the idea, let people move forward. So what happens is when we start to build a modern welfare state, and I'll try and do this in two minutes, we build a rather inefficient welfare state. What happened to the New Deal? The New Deal didn't work. Whereas in Sweden, I could tell this story in a very different way, with much stronger institutions, you built a very efficient welfare state. In the United States, you build a very inefficient welfare state. Here's just an example of it since I studied tax policy. 
The last thing I will focus you on is this category down here. The uh, tax expenditures, that's the amount of money that people don't pay in taxes legally, is equal to 50% of outlays. The United States collects less money than any other modern state except for Japan, precisely because it, the system is designed to let people who have political power access the politicians and get micro, small benefits. And at the same time, the state has very little power to expand itself in the general interest. The consequence of this, I can't but throw up here, is what I call understanding the Reagan Democrats. If you look at, this is the um, um, uh, uh, redistributive effects of a, for a medium, half of median income family in three different countries. Important part to know here is that these are the recipients. This is the pre-market income. This is after state transfers. A person at half the average in, uh, earnings, a family of four, loses money to the state in the United States. Everywhere else they gain. It's not so surprising they don't like the state. These are poor people. This is where we are now in the United States. People are always wondering, why, where does the Tea Party come from? This is the distribution of, of uh, wealth in the United States today. The top 1% owe 33% of income, et cetera. So this system, and I can, I, obviously it's a much more complicated story, read my book, um, has built a, it has created a maximum amount of individual freedom so people can grab the most for themselves. That's what it was supposed to do. And as a consequence, people don't like it. So, in sum, I think institutions are like genes or the rules of structured behavior and tell actors how to behave in a particular context. History evolves precisely because humans have the capacity to create, select, copy, and change those institutions. When building institutions, we build part of the ecological context in which future generations make choices. So the choices made in the early, in the 1700s, about the institutions that would fit in, for three million people on the edge of the richest continent of the world, are still the institutions we are, in effect, stuck with in the beginning of the 21st century. And thus, to make a pun on uh, Karl Marx, humans make their own evolutionary history but they don't necessarily make it in the way they wish. Thanks.